everybody and welcome this week to Talking Flutes with me, Jean-Paul. And yes, I know this is Claire's podcast, but I've hogged the opening as always, because if you give me an inch, I will take a mile. A uh, huge, <laughs> as Claire's laughing in the background, a huge shout out to our sponsors, TJ Flutes, for sponsoring this podcast and for being with us since we began. Now, the real prof of this Talking Flutes podcast. Hello, Claire. Hi, JP. We've got a few more questions that we need to answer from our, our listeners. Yes, I'll let you sort of tell us the question and then we'll both sort of chip in a bit and see where we get to. Yeah, the first one's a really interesting one. I didn't know whether to include this because it is one where in a world of diversity and the way that society is changing, you know, it's going to be quite a difficult subject to have a... There isn't a right or wrong, but I'll read the question and then let the audience decide what their response would be. Is it fair for orchestras and ensembles to require auditions that are blind or based solely on musical ability, or should they take into account factors such as gender, race, and socio-economic background to promote real diversity and equity? Prof. Yes, it's such a that's such a difficult question because I don't know whether it's it's sort of I don't want to offend anybody because obviously I think it's important to promote diversity and equality but i think when auditions are open there is far more risk of discrimination so i fully support blind auditions i, I didn't used to but i do now because it brings everyone to the same level and i say bring everyone to the same level is crucial i think it's easier the, for the performer you're not going to get intimidated by the panel and it's all to do with your your preparation. If you're intimidated by a screen, the preparation for that audition comes in your practice room where you imagine and create in your mind the conditions of that audition, where you're gonna think, imagine you've walked into a room and there's a, a screen and you've got your panel behind, which say, you know, ready when you are, and then you get started. And the thing is then you bring your practice, you've got to be ready to go get into your zone and just play your heart out. Where, you know, from years ago when I did auditions, the panel can really sort of put you off. I mean, I did two auditions that spring to mind. One was for the LSO, London Symphony Orchestra. And the room was quite big and the every member of the London Symphony Orchestra is a part owner they run their orchestra and so anyone can go to auditions and so there's a room of about 40 people all dotted around this small concert little small sort of recital room just sitting there and I walked in and thought oh my god I had no idea and so I found that quite intimidating in a way off off putting but you just get you have to get through it so you get through it the other audition that was quite disconcerting was in a competition where there was a huge panel it was from memory. We talked about memory um, a few weeks ago. I missed about four bars in a Paganini Caprice. <laughs> and the whole panel stuck their heads up. <laughs> <laughs> Looking down at their music, suddenly every head, the panel about 12, they all looked up because I'd missed four bars. Now, in a concert, I'd have just sailed on. Wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't have battered an eyelid because you think, well, you know, it's all to do with you just keep going, you keep your confidence and it's not important but when they all looked up I lost my confidence if that had been behind a screen I wouldn't have known that and I'd, I'd have just continued and kept my confidence going I think that screening gives you more chance to be free to be yourself and the panel can't discriminate on on gender on color on background or whose teacher you've come from you know there can't be any discrimination because of all the factors involved of, of, of those things. Yeah, I would actually totally agree. There is a need. Really? Yeah, there is a need. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there, there is a need in society to have positive discrimination because we need to have more representation of society within government, within societal structures. When it comes to the arts, when it comes to music, what comes to mind, certainly in orchestras or ensembles, is it's got to be the best person for that position, no matter what your race, gender, and sort of socio and economic background. And also, you've got to fit within the structure of the orchestra and the ensemble. 
So if you're not necessarily the best person in the audition, but you've been picked to in increase the number of diversity within the orchestra or ensemble, it's a really difficult starting point. And I totally agree that the barrier, the screen, means that the best person for that job will go through each round. Ultimately, mm -hmm. you've then got to go and sit in the orchestra, no matter what race, colour, creed, socioeconomic background. And that's when your personality and your performance will win because you've got through the audition phases that you've then got to win the orchestra over during actual concerts through trial periods. It's yeah. how you fit. So, yes, exactly. So in general terms for auditioning for an orchestra, they pick a short, they have a short list of people who will go on trial and play a few concerts for a few weeks in that position, and then they can make a decision. And that's when you can win them over because of the way you fit, your personality, they know you can play because that's how you got picked in the first place. But it's it's all the other things, the holistic view that is taken into account once you get your trial. And it wasn't that long ago where there was hardly any female faces in orchestras. We've come a long way. And yeah, yeah it's going to take us longer to be able to see more faces of colour in orchestras. But we're going in the right direction. And I think so. make sure that so to ensure there's no bias at all, even, even an unconscious bias, the screen, I believe, is important in that first instance to be able to you to walk out and play as you rather than you being looked on whatever bias, unconscious bias is there on the panel. And it's quite hard for the older people. If you've got an older person there that's in their 60s or late 60s or even early 70s, it's hard not to have an unconscious bias. So I think the screen will open up more opportunities in the short term for these musicians no, absolutely and, and you're sort of from, from from my perspective you know i was auditioning at a time when being female was a, a sort of a no-no you know <laughs> most of the jobs went to boys you didn't know what you could do in order to change that misogyny uh, <laughs> well yes it's misogyny yes mis misogynistic absolutely but but that sort of behaviour was so prevalent early on in my career. And I think when I was talking to Atara, she mentioned that too, the mm -hmm. wonderful Atara. And, and she said that she didn't get jobs. She didn't get the LSO job because she was a woman. There were no women in the LSO job, in the LSO at that time. So there you go. We're moving in the right direction. It might not be as fast as we all would like, but... The generation, the, really yeah, and the younger generation coming through are so tolerant and more tolerant. And yes. ultimately, we should be free to be who we are, whatever color, whatever race, whatever creed, whatever faith. And eventually, and I won't, certainly might be in my, my lifetime, but eventually, orchestras will be full of everybody being themselves. And the key thing is that they will all gel as musicians rather than who they are, what they look like. Absolutely. Should we move yeah, on to the next? Question. Yeah, well, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Should we move on to the next one? This is, yes. I'm going to go, I'm going to jump one and go to one which is a pet dislike of mine. <laughs> uh, only because I'm old school. But um, let's talk about movement. Part of the interpretation and feelings of freedom for the musician? Or is it off-putting? Right, Prof, I'm going to leave my views myself. Over to you. Okay. This is one of the topics that you really don't want to get me started on, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so very, put very simply, you know I like to talk simply, moving doesn't make you musical. Moving distracts the audience. It's off-putting. If you go and have a look at videos of the best players from, let's say, from the past, let's start with the past. So Sir James Galway, William Bennett, Peter Lucas Graf, Aurel Nicolet, Jean-Pierre Rampal, they're not moving. There is, of course, there is some movement. The actual phys physicality of playing the instrument means there is some movement. But the most important thing is the communication of the music. And if I make a big generalization here, quite often when you see someone moving a lot, if you close your eyes, you don't hear anything in terms of music. Sometimes people sort of move a lot in order to put into into their performance something that maybe might be lacking but if you just think of orchestras you know if you've got the flute player waving around nobody else is 
it's so distracting and then you know i've seen lots of vid- i see lots of videos on youtube where there are flute players who are so active and there might be great flute players but i don't want to i don't want to watch in which case i don't listen don't want to listen because the movement is just ridiculous so it's a turn off for me i want to just be aware of of music and what they're trying to communicate and that i feel a bond with the composer not thinking oh are they going to they might fall off the stage in a minute they've moved they've moved so much <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I have, I have to agree with you again. And I don't know if it's my age, but as soon as I start thinking about the movement of the performer, I stop, like you, stop listening to music. And I'm watching them moving left to right, down and up. And all the moving, certainly when you go down, changes the way the, the projection of the instrument goes. But I, I concentrate and I start to get sort of a bit annoyed by the amount of movement because... Most of the people I listen to are really wonderful musicians. And I'm not saying you've got to stand there like you're on parade, because a little bit of movement does enhance. But as you say, it's this dancing, it's moving, and it is... We're not talking about small movements or sort of enhancing the end of pieces or emphasis. Emphasis? Emphasize certain uh, passages. It is dancing around. And I struggle with that personally i'm not saying it's a wrong thing because this is a personal thing but i struggle with over movements and in orchestras normally you see the orchestras their strings move but sometimes when they move they're moving in sort of it's like a wave they're all moving in a certain direction which is i can get that but they're sort of it, it's just it's very different when you see string players moving than when mm. you see flute players moving because you can either go up or down can't you because if you go forwards, you're going to hit the music stand. <laughs> or you're going to lean forward, aren't you? And then you lean back. I Personally, I struggle with excess movement. I don't mind a little bit of movement, but I don't want my auditory sense to be usurped by mm. my visual sense, which I think then affects my overall view of a performance. You said you weren't going to say it's a wrong thing, so I'll say it then. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's wrong. I think that it's got a little bit out of hand and also facial expressions. And I think that your main role is to communicate the music, not communicate you, you know? So it's, it's, you, you shouldn't be distracting from the music you're trying to play. You should be, you're the, the vessel through which the music is being communicated. Now, a lot of um, people, a lot of people, Claire, would say that is their interpretation. It's, it's freeing themselves up. The, the ability to move around frees them up. But that then forgets the audience. It's all about you and your interpretation, which I get. But ultimately, you're trying to convey that music, that narrative that the composer has written to the audience. Yep. But if the audience are focusing on something different, you're affecting the outcome. Yeah, all I would say is if you've got, if, if you're seeing someone who moves an awful lot, just try closing your eyes and just listening and see if you're still, if you're actually hearing their musicality and are you hearing it in a different way and see if that, that helps. But, you know, being so busy on a stage, it's unnecessary. Mm-hmm. And it's like having a little dance. Well, you know, it's, it's not what we're meant to be doing. I don't think it's very professional, but then I'm an old bird now. So it's, it's sort of... <laughs> <laughs> it's just our opinion, of course. Can you imagine if the, the orchestra was the future, everybody moved around? It would be ridiculous. It would be sort of 50 or just 60 ridiculous. people going in all these different directions. It would be like this uh, vortex of movement. I know. And if and, and almost every time you watch an orchestra, if there's somebody moving, it's the flute player. <laughs> and it's not the second flute player or the piccolo player. It's the first flute player. It baffles me. That'd be interesting to see a piccolo player wafting around this little tiny twig. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't see trombone players, do you, dancing no. around? No. You said before it's not a case of just being like a stone. No, it's co- it's all about having controlled relaxation and letting the music come through you. Use a mirror more in practice to see whether you can still look yourself in the eye when you're playing or are you moving so much you can't see yourself. And also maybe try sitting down when you practice because that can stop a lot of the movement. So we're not saying be still, totally still. It's just, you know, don't take us on a physical journey as much as a musical journey. 
Yeah, for me, it's the same question as do you have do you have to hold the flute out at 45, de- sorry, 90 degrees or can you sort of bend it down a bit? It's um, if you hold the flute out at 90 degrees, so you, the, the flute is sort of parallel to the floor and it's sort of straight out. I don't know any professional player that actually does that. They sort of it relaxes gently down and yep. it's if you're up there, it's quite hard to move. I think every time you move, there must be a way of it affecting your embouchure because your arms and body are moving. Of course. It affects your embouchure, affects the pitch, affects the breathing, affects all sorts of things. Wish I had that excuse, though. I wish I had the excuse that I I did too much movement, which is why my pitch was always suffering. (laughs) (laughs) I think if you were to look at other skills... Oh, there's another dog need to come in now. If you would look at other skills, like golfers, they are very still before they, they might fiddle around just before they hit the ball and then they stop and then they swing. So there's a stillness, a relaxation, a stillness, controlled relaxation before they hit. The same when you see any sort of racket sport that they might fidget, but then when it comes to actually hitting the ball, there's something far more controlled and we, I think we have to to think about that when we play. It's the same sort of thing. The control you need in order to perform, and it's not by moving lots. Do you remember the pianists many years ago that used to, when they were finished, when they were playing, at the end, come the end of a phrase, put their hand right up in the air? The hands up. Yeah, and yes. that's, that's all you'd remember, this hand going up, uh, rather than the beauty of the music. And for me, I don't like excessive movement, but if you like it out there, then that is your preference, and I accept it. Do you? I do, because that's the beauty of music, isn't it? We all like different things. We all, we all have a right to prefer. I think it was Paul Edmund Davis that said that for a Sicilian, people dislike it because they say it's boring. It's not boring. We've made it boring. And I just think if you want to go to a concert to see someone dancing around, then that's great. I mean, it's different when you're, you're adding a movement into a piece of music we're talking about classical music and we're talking about playing the classics when flute players didn't move around Mm. it's fine if it's a modern contemporary piece where it requires movement then it's inherently part of that construct yeah right one other question claire this is a very quick one actually is it ethical to use synthetic or hybrid flutes such as flutes made from plastic or carbon fiber instead of traditional instruments that's wood or metal i suppose this is a hard one because What is ethical in flute making? Because we're either using a bits of a tree, or if we look at a carbon footprint of a metal flute, I'd imagine that's quite high because you're using raw materials. So this is an interesting question. This isn't one of mine. It was one that was sent in a long time ago. So is it ethical to use synthetic or hybrid flutes? I suppose it depends Um, on what's made. But it's not just, but you said instead of traditional wooden instruments, but instead of other instruments, metal, silver, gold, platinum. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can use really whatever you want. I I think that the, we're back to the end result, aren't we? Doesn't matter what you use, as long as what comes out at the end of it is what you want. I can't remember in the context in which the question was asked, but probably they're looking at ethical as in carbon footprint as in the footprint of that instrument That's a bit ethical. well I, I can't see that be that there are enough of these instruments being made to make it unethical if you want to sort of make a big deal of it then where do you start wood I, mean, well, I suppose wood wood is the only way because yeah. the, the the tree it's been it's been a tree and the tree was cut down or it fell down and you're using something that's already there Whereas mm. if we're ex- using materials extracted from the ground, then there is a large carbon footprint so potentially associated with that. And it is a weird one because look at violin players, they're using wood, aren't they? But you look at brass players, mm. that, ha- that must have a high carbon footprint because they are, it's brass, isn't it? Mm. And where do you stop? Yeah, where do you stop? It's a case of even starting because it can put you at a disadvantage. It depends. If you're, if you're a, a, an amateur player, you can be as ethical as you want. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to be a professional player, if you're just going to use a traditional wooden wooden instrument, is that going to inhibit you or damage your progression? Or do you think you can do everything you need to do on wooden flutes, which is a whole other argument? I mean, certainly in an orchestra, I think a wooden flute will fit in beautifully and blend and is part of the woodwind section. 
if you're wanting to be more of a, a solo recitalist, would it inhibit you? Or would it allow you to do all the things? I mean, I suppose a, a brand new wooden instrument will allow you to do all the things you need to do in terms of, of all the contemporary music that's being written. But I don't know, I've not played a, a brand new wooden instrument for a while. I mean, I suppose if you want to be very ethical, you'd buy a second-hand flute. You'd just recirculate yeah. what's already been made so there's no carbon footprint on anything new. But I totally get your point. As a musician, you have to play what is best for you, how it works, mm. how you can create your living, how you can put food on the table and a roof over the head. As an amateur, but you also get the chance of leading an ethical life outside of that, outside of that one instrument. As an amateur, I totally agree. You can... You can review what you're playing and the reasons why you're playing it. And if you don't want to play a new instrument that has probably measured carbon footprint, uh, just buy a buy an older one, one that's already around, it's already been there. And I, but I don't think there is, apart from playing wood, I don't think there's an easy route out of this one. There isn't. But I agree that if you if you buy second hand something that's already out there, then that really that that does help. But we all want to buy an instrument that suits us that allows us to do what we want to do so you need to find that instrument for yourself and it might be wooden it might be silver it might be gold it might be platinum it might be nickel who knows but as long as you're leading an ethical life outside of that then i personally wouldn't worry that's just my my view as always yeah we're done claire i think we're done okay. i need i need to let my doggy out for a wee <laughs> Okay, well, it's been been an absolute joy as always, JP. I think there's a few more questions we have to answer for our next time, so that's great. Good to have questions. The next time we talk, it'll be end of spring. Yeah. All the leaves will be out and it'll be warmer. Yeah, and so, I'd, I'd have had a few holidays by then, which I need. I'm in desperate need. <laughs> Budapest, Budapest in a couple of weeks. I look forward to that. I love there. They did a tour, musical tour on there 20 years ago and loved it. So just love the music and the vibe over there. Lovely, lovely. We'll have a fabulous time and we'll see each other soon. Take care, Claire, and thank you all for joining us this week on Talking Flutes. As Claire's already said, you can find us on Facebook at Talking Flutes, Instagram at Talking Flutes. You can get in touch with Claire on Twitter at Claire Flute and me at Flute. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>